Hey everybody, I'm Jeff Straw here with another episode of Producing Out Loud. We are here in Studio A here at Pyramind. Thanks for joining us. I am today with the rest of the music business curriculum teachers here at Pyramind. Uh, we thought we would get all three of us together in a room and chat about physical product and a little bit about the state of the industry, but but more as it relates to physical and digital product. So with me, of course, I've got Greg Gordon, our CEO and founder and creative director here at Pyramind, and Stefan Franz, who is the owner of IDC, uh, a, a long-standing teacher here at Pyramind, and all three of us are mentors here on the Pyramind me uh, Mentorship Network as well. So let's get physical. That's <laughs> how <laughs> so we knew. Hopefully oh, yeah. you guys are laughing too. Yeah, uh, awesome. I guess we're going to kick it off with, with that thought. And Stefan, I think you had a, a really good kind of take on this. So, so the, the question in everybody's mind is, I think, when do I need physical product or do I need physical product? Mm -hmm. It seems like a lot of money I got to come up with in order to press some as and a young inventory artist. Inventory management. And, and, and when is the right time for an artist to kind of hop into that realm? And I think you can speak mostly to that to, to get us going. Sure, sure. So, you know, uh, hello, welcome. Glad you guys can hear a little bit of uh, science from three wizards here. Uh, we've all been doing this for a long time. But one thing I'll say about the three of us is we're very open to the new state of affairs, that we don't stay locked in kind of uh, our grandpappy's uh, music industry. I think the three of us would consider ourselves fairly cutting edge. Um, so to that end, you know, uh, what we were talking about and what we always talk about is the barrier to creating product or, or creating music, I should say, is very low mm -hmm. nowadays. And so the reality is any bedroom DJ or producer can create a great song, a great album, uh, but the reality is without the component of fans, and this is something that I speak to in my class, that uh, you, there's really two different kinds of efforts that my company undertakes. One is what we'd call fan acquisition, while the other is really marketing to those fans. So I would say to most people, the first barrier is, do you have fans? I don't mean likes. I don't mean do you have 100 likes or 1,000 likes. I mean, do you have people who are going to actually buy your product when it's available? And I think that has to be in everybody's mind because, Jeff, like you said, the cost of creating physical CDs or nowadays, which I'm sure we'll get into, LPs, vinyl, um, this is very cost prohibitive to somebody who's saying, hey, I'm making this all at home with zero cost of, of goods. Um, I think when you start to see people really engaging on socials, that means you create a post uh, that says, hey, I ate uh, cinnamon granola for breakfast, and you have 22 <laughs> comments on that, you know that it's time to start thinking about what the next step is. And so for me, I think what I counsel people, uh, students and clients, is – uh, what's, what kind of engagement do you have with your audience? Uh, are you, would you consider yourself uh, somewhat successful in, in engaging fans? So at this point, I'd have to ask, um, do you have to be a touring artist to justify being able to have that level of user, user engagement? And, and what really, I mean, commenting on a granola post is, is all well and good, mm -hmm. but you know, how do you really know that a fan's going to want to buy your product other than, you know, maybe getting out in the road and really building that fan base. Yeah, so I would say that, you know, most of uh, the clients that I work with, most of the students here, for example, are at least aspire to playing live. We know that there are incredible challenges to that as well in terms of them getting booked, uh, playing in legit clubs, getting paid for their works. So there is that kind of like double-edged sword, right? Uh, the reality, though, is, and I tell my students and my clients this, if I solicit your record, whether that's a CD, an LP, digitally, to a writer in Seattle, uh, what is going to drive that guy to write about you? He's got 50 other guys like you in his hometown trying to make it. So how do I, uh, a producer, an artist, a DJ from San Francisco, make impact? Well, I do need to go to these places. And so I think the first step is, yes, you want to go beyond just your local hometown. You, whether that means going. I, I've done events where we don't even perform, where we're just up there building the brand. We're up there just meeting and greeting with people, going, doing maybe some some in-store locations or meeting some some record buyers at stores. Uh, but the goal really is to create, you know, a, uh, a little demand in those regions first. Does it mean that you can't be successful without touring? 
No. I think that there are plenty of DJs that figure out novel ways to market themselves. Uh, plenty of producers who put out really interesting stuff, and maybe they never play shows. Um, and they are developing uh, a fan base. Maybe uh, they think instead of putting all this money into gas and a van, I'm going to make a video that's going to be really compelling. I was just going to say that. And yeah. so, you know, again, I think you, the, the, the best part of all of this is it's not the old industry where you had to follow these straight rules. You're now in a time where you can gauge, for example, and again, an EDM artist um, might be in a different place than let's say a reggae artist or a rock artist who has this core fan base built around the genre that they're playing. Mm -hmm. EDM artists, and, and I work with some of the bigger you know, local labels, would say um, making physical product is the furthest thing from their mind because their audience won't buy it. So it doesn't matter how much they play live, nobody in that environment is really going to buy their CD. Mm -hmm. So again, I think there are there are like six or seven factors starting with what genre you are. That may have a play a big role because yeah. if you're an indie rocker and you're just on the road all the time, you are naturally going to grow fan base. And you're going to naturally want a CD to sell them after the show. I mean, if you've got any level of merch, that's a piece that you want. Yeah. Right. I think that that's kind of par for the course within rock, metal, indie, any of those. And I think that, you know, hitting the nail on the head around genre specific applications, it's, it's really true. Um, the, the sort of electronic community is not purchasing physical goods you know, in nearly the same way that, that, that a rock fan would do after the show. You don't expect to be able to meet the DJ after his set at the merch table. It just exactly. doesn't happen. Exactly. And that's par for the course in, in, in the rock scene, right? Yeah. And, and the kids all across the country, and I would, I would, I would argue the world, are, it's sort of the standard de facto way to engage, right? right? And that helps build that brand and shake those hands and kiss the baby, so to speak, yep. one by one uh, to just build that, fan base so how does a dj do that if he knows like i'm not going to sell anything after the show i don't even get a merch table after the show in the first place even if i wanted to right there's nowhere in the club to do it like right. any any words of kind of wisdom is it all online e-commerce or do you just um just charge more for your appearances and you know you're not going to sell anything yeah i mean i think that's what you first start thinking of and i go back to you know some of the bigger djs that i worked with over time they knew they weren't selling anything so they just upped their fees mm -hmm. and in reality they were making plenty of money which allowed them to play higher visibility shows which allowed them to eventually get to a point where putting out product made sense um i, I do want to go back a little bit for a second and talk um you know and, and I'll say this to the audience, whoever's listening, you're in a sales business. Anybody who tells you that this is a purely creative stroking of, you know, uh, of pure artistic creation is, is probably blowing smoke. Because the reality is we're in a sales business, whether that be selling physical, selling digital, selling vinyl, selling pins, selling thumb drives. We're in a sales business. And it's an increasingly niche-based sales business. Correct. When Absolutely. you speak to genres more, more than ever now, understanding your fan becomes really important because fans, although they may have a broad taste of music, mm -hmm. will have very specific niches that they gravitate towards. True. And so knowing your niche and knowing the kind of buying habits in that space, I think is increasingly important to understand whether or not you're going to be able to sell product to them. I, I agree. I also would say from a, a different time, you know, for me, when I made my first full length album, which was Nicodemus Stance All Giant in 94, um, that album was a one two-sided uh, panel that had no tray information, that barely had any information on the back. Mm -hmm. And the reality now is, w why would a fan buy a physical piece versus a digital piece? Mm -hmm. That has to be your first question, mm -hmm. right? So if you're going to sell physical, it has to be a little better than what they would buy as far as downloads. Well, and that's exactly why we're seeing this resurgence in vinyl sales. I Absolutely. Think. I mean, Absolutely. Niche based, but also a collector's item, mm -hmm. something that people can put their hands on, Absolutely. have a physical experience with, and really engage with the product. Yeah, I would also say, and, and you know, it's kind of arguing Jeff's point, in certain scenes, whether that be reggae or indie rock or hip hop, 
um, there's a certain pride that goes along with this really amazing merch table. Almost so much so, more so than like where you play on the bill, right? Whether you're a headliner or not doesn't matter. I've been in clubs where that opener had the dopest merch table, <laughs> and that's where the crowd was, not at the headliners. You know, uh -huh. sign, let me sign this uh, this twelve by twelve flat, right? Nobody was there, but everybody was at the opener. You know, buying a two dollar pin, so. I would start this conversation, and again, I think it's a good place to, to kind of put in people's minds. Start with something small. Start with a low barrier of entry. Like maybe do an EP and only press two or 300. Don't start getting into this thousand unit, I'm gonna press vinyl. It, do a seven inch. See how it sells. See if you actually have that marketing power to get people converted from what I would call a like to a consumer. That's really what we're studying now, is how do people transition from just a casual like, because I heard what you played, or I heard some music that you did, and I liked it, but I'm not a consumer yet. I think what our goal is, and for all the audience out there, is to figure out, firstly, who your base is, right? I always say this in my class, it's one of my biggest uh, pieces that I push to people, who is your end user? If you, I'm not talking about like knowing exactly tall, short, black, white, blue, green. That doesn't matter to me. Do you have enough of a base to support creation of product? That's base level. That is the starting place. Whether you do marketing or not, whether you uh, tour or not, I think it really depends how many people, when you push that uh, band camp link, and all of a sudden you see that you're starting to make revenue from that. I'll just give one example. Uh, we have a group that, that we work with, I won't mention names here because they're in the process of releasing something, but they released uh, their digital download for pre-order. They did 100 downloads in the first day. They released their physical CD, which is a collector's item, special process, special pretty, pretty physical package. Uh, they did 100, uh, 100 physical that day. And then two days later, they released a, uh, a super fan pack uh, that was a signed CD with a pin, with the digital download, and uh, basically... I, they're still selling those, and we're not even close to the street date yet. The street date's still a week or two away. So again, these are easy ways with low barriers to say, hey, I'm making this 100-person-only 100, 100 special package, and see how your fans respond to that. If you sell out in the first week, you know you got a tiger by the tail. If, if you're sitting on 100 CDs for a month, then maybe physical isn't going to be a, a way for you to go. Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, you've got a, a good eye on the DIY indie uh, release process, but obviously there's a lot, a lot of artists that are signed to labels. Mm -hmm. um, they do have a certain amount of support and backing uh, with marketing revenue to put out and support their content. And I think we have to look at that marketplace and say, you know, what's driving this resurgence in vinyl right now? Mm -hmm. And are those folks, you know, that are label backed um, excited about this resurgence? Is this something that we see continuing mm -hmm. or do we see this as really just kind of a kind of temporary blip in the radar as streaming really takes over the entire industry? Well, I'll let Jeff, because I think he can answer on this to some extent as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. When I started my label years ago, it was important for me to create a component that was in that collector's mindset. And so for my label, every single release that I did, I did double vinyl. I did minimal amounts, but I needed that to be on my merch table. I needed the credibility in the Jamaican market, in the reggae market, because... I can remember when I first started, people didn't know what to do with CDs. Mm -hmm. We could say easily, and Jeff could say at the beginning of his tenure at his last gig, um, that they had seen or could have foreseen digital completely eclipsing everything else. And I might even say that I fought that in you the beginning. You mean digital downloads? Digital downloads right. eclipsing everything else before right. streaming was even a blip. Right. Uh -huh. They said, well, you know, eventually it'll be 70% and 80% and 90%. I don't know how many meetings that that actually happened. But I think what we saw was it stalled out around 45% of the industry and hasn't really, other than year in and year out, maybe broken through 5%, 10% more. 
The resurgence of vinyl goes back to what you said before. People want a keepsake. They want something that isn't going to get wet in a pool because it dropped and they lost all their content. They want something special. And when you see television shows, specifically like Mad Men or, uh, you know, uh, you know, two or three now that I've seen, uh, Silicon Valley, where there's a whole wall of vinyl, they're, they are creating demand based on the the niche, the, I want to own this. It's something special. I well, yeah. Really and into... it's definitely a collector's mentality to a degree. I yep. would say there's some big collectors out there that love vinyl, the experience of vinyl, the sound of vinyl, the smell, the smell of vinyl. Deal. Um, and, and we've seen, I mean, I've been seeing some statistics running around that, you know, we're at a 25 year high, uh, in vinyl sales and that, um, you know, we're looking at, 260% growth um, over the last year. And that's huge. That's a big number. But still, we're only looking at about 6% of the entire you know, recorded music sales mm -hmm. uh, industry-wide. Now, they're saying that maybe it'll approach a billion dollars in a $16 billion industry this year. And that's a big number. Um, so I think it's worth looking at. I don't think it's, you know, I think it's something to consider as an artist, but I think we know that as digital downloads go down in volume and streaming goes up, I think last year streaming doubled, doubled and eclipsed download sales, right? Oh, by far. By yeah. far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we're definitely seeing that transition now. Right. Yeah. And so, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I think it's really, it's well worth looking at that vinyl is an exciting thing for a lot of people, especially that, that collector community. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I think in the long haul, we, we know uh, we're seeing clear picture that streaming is, is the way of the future. It's, it's definitely a part of the pie. Will it be the all-encompassing part of the pie? No, because I think there are other technologies out there that will create a interesting uh, uh, user experience that we haven't even seen yet. You know, one that comes to mind is some uh, company that we work with that's been talking about what they call a dot album, which in fact is a download now with uh, broadband being ubiquitous and storage capacities being what they are. Uh, buying a uh, a dot album from your favorite band that allows you the high res versions of the files that allows you two or three videos that are exclusive access. I've even seen them where you double click and now you're in a, into a browser that only you can access. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going beyond just the ownership of the content, the musical content. And uh, I think as big as streaming might become and and continues to be. That there is that true fan out there. There is this real core true fan audience that is willing to buy if they can get something exclusive, if they can touch the band. And that's really what it comes down to, right? When yeah, but that's an in-person experience versus like a download experience. And I think that those sort of quintessential behind the scenes or behind backstage passes to meet and greet with artists, those are always going to be a premium. Right, but I'm saying a dot album is one file. It's a gig. Right. It's a huge file. Right. But you download that. You now have all the AFES. Right, so you now have the best quality. You're yeah, not messing people with. don't care about quality. I mean, super fans perhaps, but I think again, sure. we're talking super niche. Sure, you know when you're when you're competing with the the Spotify's and iTunes, Apple Music's of the world that are in everybody's pocket at this point. Sure, you know, I guess the the number that I I, I found was was 10.8 million subscribe paying subscribers up to 22.6 million subscribers in a mm -hmm. single year over year growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it took them how long to get to 10, and then we doubled in 2016. Right. That's mm -hmm. a huge jump. I mean, sure. that's a significant number and that's just u.s stats from from the yeah. riaa thank you very yeah, much we're supposed to quote to, those numbers that, that speaks to a kind of a shift in mentality i think it's access new generations are, are more on concerned demand. about on-demand access than they are about ownership, ownership. Sure. It, it's a right? whole none and of us at least me we didn't speak for that. myself yeah. i like to own stuff uh -huh. man it's so hard for me to get that like yet, yet i love look, spotify it's like cars i get it people want to share cars now right. they don't want to own cars they want they want a car on demand they don't want to have the exactly. responsibility of ownership and in a way, accessing music is kind of the same. Very similar. You know, the ability to get that access when you want it, 
um, and listen to it and curate your own experiences. Playlists, I think, or, are really a big deal, especially, you know, I think that's what's made Spotify in so many ways is that ability to socialize your playlists and create those experiences. And then look, you can have them on, on demand even when you're not on Wi-Fi because you can have, you can choose to download those songs as long as you're paying for that premium membership. Sure. And I think, you know, there's been a big outrage around the royalties, I don't want to bounce around too much here, but you know, when we talk about streaming taking over, everybody starts to get you know, really uh, uh, up in arms about the royalties that are paid to artists and how many streams it takes to make a living. And, and I think the question is, as streaming grows, will the reality play out that as more of us pay for those premium subscriptions, are those royalties going to go up and justify this model for the artists and the labels out there? Well, I mean, I'll just circle back and say, Jeff, when you first started in digital music mm -hmm. and you had no idea what this new Pandora's box was, but you saw the monetization of files mm -hmm. as opposed to the monetization of physical product, product. Yeah. did anybody ever look at that and say, is this going to be the end all or was it this is just going to be a, 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 a companion to physical? Yeah, it's it's hard to say. I mean, there's you, you never. Well, the reason I is always twenty twenty. Of right? course, of course. Right? I think that what was crazy is the thing that stands out to me that was a really big flop that we've seen is was ringtones. When mm -hmm. you look at the growth of ringtones and how oh, personalizing your phone and who wouldn't want that and right. everybody wants that <laughs> and they were huge business for a couple, three, maybe five years. Sure. And everybody, you look at these graphs and they're up and to the right, the way everybody likes to see graphs. Yeah. And you think, oh, in three years, they'll be even higher. Sure. And that's why when you look at that, that vinyl stat that it's going to be a billion by next year, I'm a little this hesitant year. to this say, yeah. Like, that's, uh, close to a billion. Yeah. I mean, that's I'm a little hesitant Forbes to say that jump is going to happen. Yeah. I think it's going to be a slow, steady kind of niche climb. But all of a sudden, the bottom fell out of ringtone markets because smartphone sure. pro proliferation sort of happened. You could and make your sudden, own ringtone. You, you could you just had so many more options, sure. right? And so no one could really foresee that, oh, cloud-based access was going to be the, the way to go. Right. Internet wasn't fast enough, especially not mobile internet, mm -hmm. to make that a reality. So, right. so the tech eclipsed the sort of ownership mentality, much like tech sort of, you know, with CDs replaced, replacing vinyl when you had, oh, you have to go replace your collection, right? The, the major labels love any new format where everybody's got to rebuy everything, right? Yep. Eight track to vinyl to, I guess, vinyl to eight track to A cassette, to somewhere cassette in there, right? and then CD, right? And right. then all of a sudden, oh, now you got to download it or you could rip your own CD collection, but who has time for that really? Just go buy Just it again, Just go buy kid. it again, right. But th that brings us around to this, which is interesting, I think, because, you know, you were mentioning the indie artist versus the artist that's got a marketing budget. When you look at the top 10, this is 2015 now, top 10 albums sold, when you're talking about vinyl, it's Adele, Taylor Swift, Pink Floyd, speaking of catalog, mm -hmm. right? The Beatles, Abbey Road, speaking of catalog, Miles Davis, kind of blue, yes. Arctic Monkeys, Suf John Stevens, Alabama Shakes, Hozier, Hoosier, Hoosier, Ho Hoosier. Uh -huh. and the soundtrack for Guardians of the Galaxy. How the hell did that make it in the top 10? I'm not sure, but like... Uh, these are vinyl sales. That's right? the top 10 vinyl sales mm -hmm. for 2015. There's not, a, not an indie record on there. I mean, Suf John is... Borderline Maybe. indie, I guess. Yeah, you could say could that say Adele that. is kind of indie because she licenses her tracks. Yeah. As opposed to Te Te technically, she's the biggest <laughs> indie Sony of Red. the world. She's the biggest. Yeah, but she's that's not a deal. You know, we okay. could we could but spend a the whole hour talking about name, that. Right? Sure. And sure. obviously, it gets you know it, it boils it fans out pretty quickly. And there are a lot of I think a lot of artists and a lot of labels making significant revenue to them. Right. In this, in this niche, in this niche, which is important, right? Like it's not a big global drop in the bucket, but if it's an important part for that particular artist or that particular label, it's a healthy part of their revenue stream. Then absolutely, carry on. Well, the one thing I'll also talk about a little bit, and I think you can remember those days. I remember when I first started IDC, and I would go into Amoeba pretty regularly. And you know what I saw in vinyl in those days? Foo Fighters. Pearl Jam, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. notable bands that could sell a lot, mm -hmm. but because they felt their fans wanted this intimate experience, uh, you know, I remember uh, Jerome, I forget who it was, uh, Portishead uh, or somebody, where he was just so into it, he had to buy the entire collector package. Mm -hmm. This is a man who didn't really, you know, I'm not going to say he didn't have the money to buy groceries, <laughs> but but he was spending 200 odd dollars on this Right. fan package that gave you a Polaroid and gave you, you know. So the reality is, although the majors, which by proxy sell more, are going to always dominate the top of those charts, right. 
Um, the reality is there's there's a much lower barrier to making vinyl now, right? In my day, you had to have some money behind you. You had to have a plan. You had to remaster for vinyl. There were so many f pieces. Um, just understanding uh, a printed jacket, you know, what that costs sure. to make. Yeah. Now I'm watching people turn around. I have a client right now that just turned around 310 inches, and I guarantee you they sell them all. Right. And I guarantee you they take the money from selling them and press another 300. And they're less worried. They don't think they'll get a lot of downloads. They might get some streaming, but because they're a live act and because their focus is about honing and growing a fan base, they want that fan base to take something home. So that's a good example, though, because you say that's a live act, and mm -hmm. so they're selling those at the shows. I they are selling them at the shows. Sales. They're selling them on Bandcamp. They're selling them to fans who didn't have the 20 bucks at the show, but they know they can buy it on Amazon the next day. Uh -huh. I mean, that's, you know, it. as much as I think we're light years ahead of where the industry was, I think there are some little pieces that still consistently come back around as far as, where the future is. I don't think we could, in the era of digital sales, I don't think we could have predicted streaming being as big as it is. The same as I would say, halfway through that model, I don't think we could have predicted vinyl's resurgence. Mm -hmm. it, not in the numbers that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. And again, mm -hmm. just to be clear, I want to be clear for the audience, in 2008, in America, we sold 800,000 units of vinyl. 200, uh, 2008, 800,000. This year, we're on track for 7.1 million units yep. sold. And so when you see that T-shirt that says vinyl, the MP3 killer, that is a reality. Like, there, it is impacting download sales. Yep. It is impacting... Wait, wait, how many vinyl units did you say? 7.1 this year. This year. If that's that's true, well, they said there was 3.2 million LPs sold last year. Right. I think that if you take into account 12-inch uh, singles and 10 inches and uh -huh. 7 inches, all vinyl mm -hmm. went from about 6.9 last year. They're, they're putting it at about 7.1 this year. You know, and as a vinyl buyer for Virgin mm -hmm. back in the day, right, I was seeing dance music fly off the shelves from the UK, from Australia, I would import stuff. And, you know, 12 inches were the only way to play music in the club, mm -hmm. right? And so if you're a DJ and wanted something different than the guy that played before you, you were buying new 12 inches every single week. That's true. Like, right? I, I mean, that's what put me out of the DJ business, Jeff. To be quite honest with you, I think it was a it was a drag then to you know go to Amoeba and drop you know I made a hundred dollars the night before or two hundred bucks and right. it was gone the it next gone. day because I had to buy the newest. Right, freshest. and you're paying nine dollars for a song. You're yeah. paying nine ninety nine for a twelve inch, and you know full well you're not going to flip it over and play both sides in the night because that's just cheesy. Right, right? that's As not DJ, what you do. Like, it's you not pick what you the do. track and you're you, going to play that You got the track. one that's your for your set and your sound, and so yeah, you were playing an incredible premium, and uh, you know then comes Beatport. And, and really shifted that model. And then you look at sites like Pulse Locker now, which is sort of the streaming version of a beat port for the sure. DJ community. I don't even know if those, how those, like, those guys are doing, but when I saw them come out, it was like, oh, somebody's trying to shift this ownership model from the DJ to the, the sort of a rent to own model, mm -hmm. subscription based model as well. And so I think that even in the tastemaker live performance DJ sector, we're seeing that, right? Yeah, well, I think the the access, the you know, the use of Tractor and you know, uh, Serato have made it so that all you Almost really wore need my to do today, <laughs> all, you, all you really have to do is become a one-time consumer because you can now take this product and go out and DJ your parties. And if it really means enough to you, if it's really somebody you care about, then maybe you're going to go buy their record or you're going to go support them. I know a lot of DJs today that will buy MP3s or buy even AFs or Waves to play at shows, but then go back and buy the record because they want the record. Uh -huh. And again, that's not everybody, but there's sure. plenty of people, sure. let's say, in hip-hop or reggae. Um, just to circle back, because I read something really interesting. Um, so I'm a, I'm a big reggae guy. I've collected reggae vinyl for years. Um, one of the most interesting numbers I never understood or never thought was uh, Japan now claims more reggae albums per capita than Jamaica. And so what we're not talking about here is that there is this huge resurgence, not just in America. We see it in America. We can talk about those numbers. But look at Europe. Look at the disco scene that's happening in, yeah. in France. People are still buying 12 inches. Well, and people just it just speaks to the point that people have different buying habits around the world. Absolutely. And the Japanese are buying CDs still. CDs, you but, still but LPs too. still have a warehouse with full of CDs, and yeah. they're selling them at record levels over there. 
whereas we've seen a massive decline here. In the I'm United not mad States. at that. Yeah. As a CD <laughs> distributor, I'm not mad at the Japanese and audience. Be. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and again, yeah. Uh, uh, my friends are running like niche metal labels, niche drum and bass labels, and they 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 won't even they're they're based here, but they'll press vinyl in the in Europe and sell in distributors in Europe, and you know have to import a few for their right. own sort of shows and whatnot here. Yep. And it's pretty common. Yep. I think that European vinyl market is just doing good in those niche markets um, and again uh, it all goes back in my mind i know it sounds crazy but it all goes back to knowing your end user right, right. if you know and, and i say this in my class and and you guys are certainly i'm preaching to the choir uh, a music supervisor who's going to use your music in a game or a tv show is a totally different end user than a fan who's going to find you on socials yeah. like what they hear and buy in those are two different end well, users. Well, music supervisors refuse physical product, at least any of the ones that I know. They've, sure. they've been on that bandwagon for four or five years. But I think you could appreciate back in the day when we were licensing, um, ABC would say, if you don't have a physical product available, we're not featuring your record. Oh, because man. their intention was, you know, we want to drive people to buy your products in stores. And it doesn't make sense for us if you're not going to put it out for, for us to feature it. Um, I'll also, I think you bring up a good point, and I think it's a point that's I have to make. As a marketer, less about being a distributor and more about being a marketer. As a marketer, it becomes very difficult to market a product that doesn't actually have a product. And by that I mean, it's all well and good to, to send people a link to download your record or to send somebody an email attachment with an MP3. But the reality is, nobody's really going to review you off of that. You might get a little... I don't know. I kind of disagree with you there. Yeah, I, I mean, kind of own a marketing company, bro. I know, I know I, I, is what I, I do. Know, I know, I know. But I think, you know, what happens is, you know, you get these piles of CDs on your desks and you get so many promo packs, it becomes, it's difficult to manage. Uh, and I, a lot, lot less people have CD players now. And I think it's a lot easier to click on a link and listen and review than it is in many cases to have to deal with the physical product. Well, I, and I think that's just a mentality. I'm not saying that's true across the board. Um, I know I've talked to lots of bloggers and, and folks in that space that feel that way. Sure. And so, you know, the good news is in all of this is that steady downward trend we've seen in recorded sales of the music industry has reversed itself. That is true. So no matter what we may agree or disagree on, revenue we, revenue is growing in this yes. industry. It's turned around. I think last year we saw almost a 12% growth in recorded music sales. Yes, after and, a 20% drop, what, for five years right, in a row. Right, right, right. So the good news is that people are buying vinyl, mm -hmm. that people are buying music, that people are buying premium subscriptions to Spotify, to Pandora, although I know Pandora's had difficulty. But even in streaming, these are some big, giant companies that are extremely well-funded and includes a lot of the labels mm -hmm. that have gotten on board and poured their money into the streaming model now that they're realizing, finally, you know, what is going to turn this industry around. And I, I think it's undeniable that, you know, music is coming back. And, I, and for me, that's the most exciting thing to see that there's this resurgence in people buying music and i think it's just taken time because we've gone through such a big transitional phase here over these last 10 years sure and technology like always has been the driver of that yep. you know and it's unfortunate that the major labels were not quick enough to understand this transition process because i think as a result of it we've all suffered you know, and so the industry as a whole has suffered from the uh, what I call the dinosaur effect, the slow moving, not really responsive. You know, if the music industry was a jaguar or, you know, a, a bobcat or even a jackrabbit or even a jackrabbit, <laughs> something that jumped with <laughs> with the time. Right. As opposed to just kind of slowly saying, wow, look, you know, uh, downloads, you know, are kind of eating us up now. You know, if oh. they're. We, we've seen it now turn to who owns who owns Spotify, you know, right. who owns Pandora, you know, who are the investors in these companies? We know that the major labels are investing heavily in the streaming companies because they they see the future. Well, they learned they learned from when you know Steve Jobs went down there to get those licensing deals for iTunes. They all thought, oh, cute, how nice, we'll have a little extra revenue stream. Mm -hmm. uh, little, little did they realize. Little did they realize what a, a, a real dynamic shift this was going to create in the entire industry. Industry. It's true. So I, I don't know where you want to go with that. Yeah, I just wanted to say the one the one thing for me around the marketing side, back to your earlier point, Stefan, which was that it's tough to market something that sort of doesn't exist or doesn't have a tangible 
element to it. I think that for me and what I've seen is that it's about the story. And if the story and the music themselves are undeniable, mm-hmm. the, the, the fact of whether or not there's a physical good along with it is, is not irrelevant, but it doesn't make nearly as big of a factor. True. But what you can probably argue is that by the point that your music is that great and you have this much of a story to tell, you're at the point where you do have physical product. And so those, they kind of all play hand in hand. Agreed. Agreed. Um, it but, comes but that's down really to that what you gotta, line, what you, know? you got to lead with is, is that, you know, your music's got to be great and, and it has to sure. be absolutely phenomenal mm-hmm. in order for you to have any chance of, bursting through that noise floor, right? Right. And then you got to figure out how do I tell my story that's not just like, oh, I was born in Ohio and I learned to play guitar in my garage and who cares, right? Right. Like every other kid in the the country, but maybe it's working with a marketing company or working with a publicist in order to sort of craft a story that's both authentic, but it's also compelling. Right. And that's what's going to resonate coupled with really good music and Agreed. a great branding and visual presence. Absolutely. And, right? I, and, and without all three of those things firing, it, like the, the fact of whether you've got a CD or a piece of vinyl to sell is going to not really make as big of a difference. Right. I mean, I, I do think, and for everybody's, you know, everybody out there who's listening to this, it, it comes back to that compelling story. Yeah. It, are, is it interesting? Do I get past your first two lines of your bio? Because in my mind... Uh, if I don't get to the meat of what you're all about and who you are, I'm never going to be convinced right. to transition from a like to a consumer. That's that trigger is going to come, uh, you know, by seeing the band live, for example. You know, wow, I, I've heard this these MP3s. They're okay. I want to go check these guys out and see if they're good. Oh my God, they blew me away. Well, of course, at that point. I'll buy whatever you got because I'm hooked. I'm in. Right. And I do see that as the future of the industry is, you know, there is going to go back to this kind of gatekeeper mentality, but it's not going to be the companies that are the gatekeepers. It's going to be the fans who are saying, I'm behind this band 100%. I'm going to invest my time to help support them. And we know the most successful bands, like you said, already have the fan base to buy anything. Yeah, and to me, that's one of the coolest things about what we've seen. I mean, we all talked about the democratization of the internet back in the day, Mm -hmm. and we've seen this tremendous consolidation around these big internet giants. But the one thing that that has proven out is that the social networks build fan opportunities and that they create momentum for artists Yes, and that there's a socialization behind that, that when your buddy says, have you checked these guys out? Right. And that is the golden nugget right there to get that kind of momentum happening Mm -hmm. where people are buzzing about you because you're writing great songs, you're producing great sounding music, you have all of those elements firing off on each other. Then that that to me, that is the beauty of what the Internet has created for us. There's a lot of other stuff that hasn't turned out to be so great Mm -hmm. when you look at the, you know, like the big four giants of the internet and how there's this huge consolidation of power going on um, behind these giant tech giants, if you will. And I'm, I'm going to stay away from their names right now, but everybody knows what I'm talking about. Sure. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm, I remain hopeful that that level of social networking and interactivity within communities, no matter how niche they are, creates that excitement so that people still, you know, even the, the DIY indies out there are going to ha- be able to really make something of themselves if they really are that great. Because as, as uh, a great blogger guy that I know that I read a lot of says a lot, you know, good isn't good enough anymore. It's true. Thank you, Bob Lefsitz. Yeah. You know, there's no doubt about it. How did I know that's who you're <laughs> <laughs> You know, you got to be great. And I think that's what yeah. we're alluding to. And, and that fundamentally defines when, when product, when is, product is necessary. Yeah. The other thing that I want to go back to, and uh, as well, I'll go back to a historical moment for us, because I think maybe some of you as viewers maybe are, uh, you know, a little younger than we are. But I go back to the maybe. moment, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe, um, I go back to the moment that I saw DJ Shadow's robot and I was like, okay, so wait, this is $50 or $45. It was an import from Japan and everyone had to have it. And you missed, a lot of people missed out. They didn't buy the robot. They didn't buy the first thing. So what was the next thing? It was the, the car the van that played vinyl and drove around Mm -hmm. now i would never trust my vinyl to that van but everyone wanted that van everybody (laughs) yeah i mean i sat on tour and again i won't mention the names but a very big band that i toured the world with and everybody everybody wanted that van 
and people were pulling them out like did you see i bought the van nowhere in there did i mention music yeah. nowhere in there did i mention music and so again you have to think when you get to that level you know and again there are only maybe 100 or 200 bands that are at that level that they can literally monetize anything that they're trying to monetize they shouldn't count in this dialogue because the reality is once you have that 10,000, 100,000, 500,000 fans, you're pretty much selling them anything you can <laughs> make. Everybody up till that has the job of engaging their fans to yeah. the point of wanting to be so excited. Oh my God, I got I to gotta get it. Yeah. Yep. And I think that is coming back into the industry. Right. Well, unique packaging. I think unique that's what packaging you're is about. a part of it. I know our friend Matt Moldover has created some really unique packages. Yeah, I was going to get to Moldover yeah. actually because <laughs> I show that in my class. We we do a physical manufacturing class in the 110, and uh, or sorry, in the 101, um, and I use Moldover's exact product that he came to me and he said hey i want to distribute this and it had like a led you could press the button it made noise it was super cool i said so uh moldover how much do these cost he goes i don't know that costs like 50 right i'm like that piece cost you 50 dollars uh -huh. now of course if we knew then what we know now that people would pay that kind of money but the retail environment and, and again we don't have to go too deep into this you, you have to draw the line between what is reasonable Right, I, well, I that CD that I did, the Destination Lounge compilation, right, sure. which was a double CD of all Bay Area electronic music, and and instead of just okay, it's a double CD and throw it in a package, and like we really took the time to, I think we had a thirty-two page Huge booklet, booklet in that, that thing, was amazing, right? Sure, that was right. That I, piece of I, product. I ran around town with a photographer and did the cover art and did all the photos of all the bars yeah. and like the club guide and the bios and the, it was a it was a labor of love, right? Yeah. And to see that thing sell and sell and sell and sell, and like we couldn't barely stop enough of it at, at Virgin to mm -hmm. keep it keep it around it was it was fantastic and it was a testament yes the music was great and the first track of both discs was like heavy hitter get you right where you wanted to go but it looked really sexy mm -hmm. and it's a big thick you know those old school yeah oh yeah I remember that right I probably have that record in my collection I definitely probably. still have a couple I'm sure you do you know, not I that was, many though I'm I was be super very excited stingy. to be a part of that right yeah it was it, it, yeah. it, it was it was it was a good moment and it was like me as a buyer seeing what works so well in that store and then basically crafting product to sell at that store. Then it became the best selling dance CD of the year, finally eclipsing those two guys from DC called Thievery something or other. What are they called? Thievery, somebody oh, yeah, those Thievery guys. Corporation. Um, you know, but it was it was very much me taking my my kind of DJ brain and my marketing brain saying, okay, well, I'm going to make something that I know will work here, and if it works here, maybe it'll work in New York, and mm -hmm. it sure enough, it, and did. it did. It, it worked in most major markets, and it's just a testament to like put out your best looking thing you possibly can. You, I, we've all been handed demo CDs with Sharpie on them. And it's like, oh, you That's just want to no go. I mean, you just want to be like, it's okay, buddy, you know, better luck next time. And you see less and less with physical not being around and you can't burn CDs in your Macs anymore. Sure. So fortunately I get less of those, but people don't get how important that visual presence is to make that first impression before anyone even clicks play. And, and maybe that's your email blast. Right. Maybe that's your, your SoundCloud banner. Maybe that's your Facebook banner. Right. But it should look pro, Absolutely. right? And it should be consistent. Yeah, I mean, another thing that I'll jump on, and, and again, I think you know we haven't touched on this at all, and this certainly could be a whole nother conversation, is most of us, meaning the independent music community, don't have endless amounts of money to spend on what we're doing. Not to mention endless amounts of time. But endless amounts of money because <laughs> yeah. what, what, I mean, what do most up-and-comers need today? They need somebody to take make an investment in yeah. them. And so you have to start with the idea that by making cool flyers and cool stickers and later cool product, you're starting to develop a package mm -hmm. that would allow you to then go, let's say, to an investor rather than just the old school model of I'm trying to get a booking agent or I'm trying to get a manager. Most of these kids today, they have the chance of the rapper mindset, right? If I just get somebody with money behind me and help me to get where I need to, spend some money on marketing, buy some good product. Well, how are they going to be sold? Most of these kids can't write a business plan. Right. So what is their business plan? Their business plan is I'm just going to go out and make product. I'm going to go out and develop myself as an artist, a brand notoriety. And then I can take all of that, all these cool stickers and flyers and CDs and LPs and show them to an investor and say, here's my kit. If you like my music, look at what I'm capable of doing. And so again, I think it, it does open doors. I will go back to the the packed merch table 
no matter who it is, no matter where it is, gets my attention. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's because I'm an old school guy and I like to touch the product, or maybe it's just indicative that when we see stuff like that, we feel like the band is more professional. And so that's really what I would wrap around in saying, CDs are the lowest financial bar to professionalism right now. And I don't mean that as a dig on streaming or on digital. I mean it as when somebody sees that merch table or you have the ability to pull something out and I'm the old school DJ who has that shoulder bag and Greg knows because we were friends in those days, I would come to the studio and the first thing I do is flip open my bag. What do I have? What can I give you? Promos. promos. And, and I miss goes, promos, And man. that goes a lot further in my mind than saying, uh, here, dude, here's a you know a QR code. Go download right. my thing. I'll email it to you later. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, and I'm sure I'll that- I'll take thumb drives any day. I you just know. are back on- You hey, Do you know. own a thumb drive company? I, I, that we don't know about it's is, there, is there something you yeah, know it's just easy i I'm, I'm big on ease of access and also high resolution files you know let's not forget cds are 16 bit 44 1k yes. if i can get a 24 bit uh master recording i'm excited but you're that's, the only person who can play it greg no that's not true <laughs> oh Stephen. there aren't too many people will play your 24 right. bit file you know <laughs> So I'm yeah I mean I love high fidelity audio I know it's not everybody's thing yeah but a high fidelity listening experience is amazing when you really hear a high fidelity and you're in a high fidelity environment mm -hmm. I mean it changes the listening experience dramatically. Look, one of the first things that I say to my students when we start talking about manufacturing and we start talking about you know what the difference between let's say a mastered file and an unmastered file is. The real reality is if you sit down and you listen to vinyl, which is a subpar format to high resolution audio or even average resolution audio, for some reason our ears, and again, we could debate this all day and night, yeah. there are people that really can't can't hear the difference. That, that simply I will sit with and play both for them, A, B it, and they're, no, sounds the same to me. Mm -hmm. Well, they're, they're not educated ears. I mean, just like everything, you know, in this world, wine, you know, good food. Right. You might say that a two buck chuck good audio. Is, is the you, same. You need to educate the listener's your ear just sure. like you need to educate your palate and understand the difference between a compressed audio streaming MP3 file and, and a full bandwidth high resolution experience. Yeah. And, you know, that's just, I think that's a matter of time, uh, you know, a matter of access. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's why organizations like the Academy of Recording Arts are important because they really can speak to that to a large community. Mm -hmm. uh, even though the membership there is only 20,000 plus people, you know, education starts somewhere and we all have to, you know, kind of rally to that cause because it's something worth knowing about. Even if all we want is easy access, because I'm, I'm that way. Look, I said, hey, I want ease of access, but I also really value a high fidelity listening experience. Sure. And, and, and in a way, vinyl does provide a high fidelity experience. Agreed. I mean, it's a different kind of hi-fi. It's not a pure digital file. But it has its own high fidelity resolution that is exciting when heard on a really great system. Yeah, but let me go back to just this point. If you were at uh, the Louvre and you saw a poster of a picture of the Mona Lisa, would that move you in the same way as the Mona Lisa itself? So therein you have the difference between a 5 meg MP3 uh -huh. and a 50 meg A4 wave. Yeah. To me, you have to, to be able to experience that higher quality to understand what you're missing. Yeah, I want right. to go to the live show and see her dance, though. That's yeah. what I want to see. And that's, that's <laughs> right? yes. in the end, the live. I think when you talk about professionalism, the live show speaks just hugely towards that. Absolutely. Yeah. When a band performs and they are tight and they are on fire and you see that audience responding, I don't care what's on their merch table at the end of the day. Sure. All I care about is they killed it. I saw a band, an awesome San Francisco band, I'll name drop them, they were Conbrio at SF Jazz oh, right. sure. uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And I didn't go hunting for their merch table. All I cared about was experiencing that live show. Sure. They were professional. They were engaging. They were exciting. Their songs were great. So, you know, that ultimately speaks hugely to, you know, the fan base. And sure. Creating that fan base that ultimately won't be able to get enough. So they want to buy that, you know, whatever it is they're going to get in their hands on a CD, vinyl, etc. So I think with that, we should probably kind of call this a wrap. Okay. I think I think the big takeaway is make great 
music. Yes. Make make great music and care enough. I, I would tell anybody who's listening, you are your own worst critic, but you're your own best critic. And if you feel like, you know, hey, I really don't have the budget to do that, um, bigger is not better. You know, more is not better. Quality, crafting. Consistency. This, consistency. I mean, all of this follows, you know, what the industry has always been about. But now more than ever, I mean, you want to take a step up, it is about taking that real step up and having something you're proud of, having something you you feel good out there telling people, this is me, this is me. Because it never goes away. That's the other thing we know is once it's out there, it's out there. So, fellas, great. Good stuff, man. Good to see you, buddy. Give you a pound. Uh, Give you a uh, a cross, Greg. Right right, right in the face. Well, thanks again. Uh, You can always hit us at producingoutloud at puremind.com. You can leave comments in the YouTube video. We love hearing uh, thoughts around these. We'll try to all chime in on any questions that you've got on those. Uh, And again, we're all available on the Mentorship Network, too. So should you want to kind of take any music business questions and, and get one of us online one-on-one we're more than happy to do that as well so thanks again for being here greg thanks stefan always good to see you man pleasure man uh until next time we'll see you soon yep peace take care if you're a music producer subscribe to our channel and stay up to date on the latest pure mind tutorial videos track breakdowns elite sessions and more visit us at puremind.com